Good morning, church. How are we doing? It sounds like we're not doing so hot. Come on, church. Are we doing good? Is God good? God is good. And all the time. Guys, who's happy to be in church? Come on. You know, it wasn't too long ago that we were looking at the news and seeing the horrific things going on overseas. And our heart was breaking. And we were thinking to ourselves, man, how fortunate we are to be where we are. And we were just being thankful to God. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, a couple months pass by and things kind of fade and we move on. You know, and this happens in our life. This happens that we, uh, you know, we just kind of forget about the difficult things that other people are going through. But it's good to remind ourselves that we are truly blessed. Folks, we can be together in safety, in warmth, singing wonderful songs of worship with beautiful music and studying God's word together. It's, it's truly a blessing. If you agree, say amen. 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 All right. Well, this morning I want to share a message from a scripture in Acts um, that has been weighing on my heart for some time. I titled my message, The Known God. The Known God. God. And this title is inspired in part by the scripture around which I want us to, to center our discussion this morning. And this scripture is in Acts chapter 17. And I want us to start uh, our discussion this morning from reading this chunk of scripture that is recorded in the middle of the book of Acts. And this particular chapter is talking about the missionary trip of Paul. He had gone to all the different areas and he was in a place where he was being chased out by some of the, the Jews that were persecuting him. Uh, he was in a place called Berea. And the Berean believers, they hurried Paul away and they sent him away to Athens so that he could have some rest. And so essentially Paul was taking a break from his missions trying to chill, so to speak, in the city of Athens. And this is where I want us to pick up the story. It's in verse 16, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed that the city was full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers as well were conversing with him. Some were saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Verse 22, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For a while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship. I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, even as, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his descendants. Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image, form, an, an image formed by human skill and thought. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. And then the rest of the chapter basically finishes off saying that some of them were mocking him and saying, oh, you're preaching resurrection, okay. And then others that believed on him. But this great story in Acts 
uh, we see that Paul enters the heart, you could say the belly of the beast, of idolatry. He went to Athens, and we understand that all the other people in, in the surrounding areas they had their own gods, but Athens was like the mother load of gods. You know, if you went there, you saw all the possible gods that you could ever see. They had a whole pantheon of gods. And they had Zeus and Ares, and maybe, you've, you've, maybe those names sound familiar to you. But Paul comes in here, and he starts to be just bold. I mean, this man was on vacation, so to speak. He's trying to take a break. But he comes to the city of Athens, and his spirit is provoked within him. And he says, folks, you are religious. You're very religious. You worship, but you worship in ignorance. The true God is unknown to you. See, they thought they knew God. They thought they had an idea of, well, you know, we have all these different gods. And so we figure if we have, if we have a, a coverage, a good sort of, so to speak, spread of all the gods that there are, then we will know the true God. But Paul says, you worship God in ignorance. He says, you worship. You are trying to worship. You're very religious. And they were religious. They were very, they were philosophers. They were, that's what they did. The Bible tells us that they spent their time on nothing other than trying to find new deities. But Paul says, you worship in ignorance. He says, you have nothing but idols here. And the one true God is unknown to you. Church, my hope this morning is to stir within our hearts the godly desire to know God. To know the true God. See, because I think in America, sometimes the true God is the unknown God to us. We think he is the known God. We feel like we have no God now, you know? And maybe we don't have the same trouble with idols that the Athenians did. Maybe we don't have, you know, the carved images. And we understand, just even, you know, in our uh, standard Christian culture, we understand that, like, you know, cars and money and Bitcoin can be an idol to you. And so we understand, okay, we can't make an idol of this. So we don't, maybe don't have the same exact trouble as Athenians. But the question is, do we know God? Do we have a true knowledge of God? Most of us who have been Christian for a while feel like we kind of know God. You know, you ask, brother, do you know God? And I say, yeah, I know God, you know. <laughs> because maybe we've been Christian for a while, and we started reading our Bible, and we're praying, and maybe we hear the Holy Spirit speaking. Or maybe we've been in ministry for a while, and we've seen God move. And we feel like we have a pretty good idea of, of who God is and how he works. You know, and the Lord just put it on my heart, you know, and we say things like that. And we feel like we know God until, until God comes and brings something into our life that goes against the grain of what we feel God should be like. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. And I'm speaking to some of you because some of you know what this is like. When you thought, this is, this is how God is leading me. And this is the plan that God has for my life. This is the plan that God has for our church. This is the plan. This is who God is. He is this and he wants to do this in my life. And then God comes and brings something totally different. And it messes you up. It destabilizes you. And you're left wondering, Lord, is this really even you? God, I think I know you by now after X years of having served you and having read the Bible and listened to so many sermons, I know you, but this, ugh, this can't be you. I want to bring an example of Jonah because this is exactly what happened to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, do you guys remember, in the Old Testament, and God sends him a command. It says, hey, I want you to go preach to the Ninevites. And Jonah's like, no, Lord, not them. God, you know that they skinned our people alive. You know that these people, if anyone is deserving of your just punishment, is the Ninevites. God, I know you, Lord. I know you're a just God and you judge righteously. And no, you can't try to say, no, 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 no. God, no, I don't want any part of that. Lord, is this, is this even you? I could have sworn maybe, the, maybe I didn't hear God right. It blows Jonah's mind. It goes against what he thinks he knows that God to be like. The same thing happens to John the Baptist. He was a man, he was a fiery preacher. He was a fire, he had a fiery ministry. That was the true flame of fire ministry, am I right? <laughs> he was over there, he was preaching the hellfire and he was owning the Pharisees and man, he was slamming Herod. And then somehow his ministry leads him to end up in prison. And then he sends messengers to Jesus. 
And he has one question for Jesus. He says, are you the one? Are you the one who we were waiting for or should we wait for another? It's like, John, but weren't you just a couple chapters earlier saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm not worthy to even undo his sandal. And now he's wondering, Lord, is this you? God, I thought you were going to do something different. God, I thought I knew you. I was preaching in zeal and you're not what I thought you were. So the question, folks, for us this morning is, do we know God? Do we know God? And I think Jonah and John did what we sometimes do. They filtered God through their own conception of what is right and what God is supposed to be. See, in their mind, they had an expectation of God. They thought God was going to do a certain thing. And Jonah, it happened to him twice, actually, unfortunately. And God was masterfully trying to change his heart. He sent him first, the, the, the first time, right? He was swallowed by a whale. And a whale is very soft. So, you know, Jonah kind of, he was, he was trying to, as much as he could, not break Jonah. And then Jonah is sitting again on the hill and he wants to see God destroy the, destroy the city. He's like, man, these guys, they got to come unto them. And God saves the city. And so Jonah is, again, he's just struggling with, with, with his own misconception of God. And John also, he thought that Jesus was going to come. He's going to establish the kingdom. And then all of a sudden he's in prison and Jesus is not coming to free him, not coming to rescue him. And we get in trouble, folks, when we start to try to put God under our morals and our ethics. When we try to conform God to our idea of what is right and what is good, rather than our morals and our ethics conform to God. We can't do that. We cannot, we cannot try to fit God into how we see things are supposed to be right. I'll give you an example. A thing that has become popular to say these days is that a loving God does not send people to hell. You'll hear people say, you know, my, my God, my God does not send good people to hell. My God this and my God that. It's like, well, I don't know what kind of God you're serving, but it ain't the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, we read that there are some people that don't choose him, they will end up in hell. That is the sad reality, and that is supposed to motivate us. It's not supposed to be a burdensome and negative message that we just, we can't get over, and it's a, a prickly, unpopular thing we don't want to say. And we, we, we like to soften the blow, you know? We like to do this too. We like to say, well, it's true. God does not send people to hell. People choose it themselves. But then we read in Revelation that there are the angels that cast the wicked people into hell. And folks, let me tell you right now, that does not feel good saying from the pulpit. I'll tell you right now, that does not feel good. Say, that does not, it does not feel good to say that from the pulpit. And we as humans, we try to soften the blow of the gospel. We try to, try to change it and be like, well, you know, we want to make it a little bit more popular. We want to make it a little bit, a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more attractive, you know? These, like people don't want to hear just these, these things that are so offensive, things that are so, so uncomfortable. Sometimes we try to romanticize God, that he's all about us, that that he does nothing but pursue us. God is only there to pursue you. He's obsessed with you. God just wants to grab your heart. He's like that, to borrow a phrase, a controversial phrase, we make God a desperate boyfriend. All he is is pursuing you. He's just running after you. And all he wants is, is you, you, you. And you're just like, oh, I don't know. Do I feel like I want to give myself to God this morning? And we have this romantic understanding that God is just, he's running after you. And he's, that's all he does. That's all he cares about is running after you. Or maybe we try to make God this harmless, benevolent being. That God, he's, he, he just he cares for your, for your dreams. He wants, to, he wants to help you realize your inner potential. But that's all he is. Folks, but do we know the true God? Do we know the God of the Bible? We unfortunately try to make God a little easier to understand. And we make this conception of God. And this is exactly, folks, like the Athenians, we start to build these versions of God that we can grasp, that we can understand, we can see, that we can package away in our minds or, or have a little platitude that we can post on Instagram or whatever it is. 
And the Israelites did the same thing. You know, when, when they came out of Egypt, we think that the Israelites made themselves an idol. We think, okay, they didn't want to serve God, so they made themselves this golden calf. But that's not actually what happened. The Israelites made this golden calf as an image of Jehovah. They thought this was the God that led them out of Egypt. This was Jehovah. But, but their issue was that they tried to make God something that they could grasp. See, they, they weren't comfortable with the fact that they couldn't see God. They weren't comfortable with the fact that they couldn't understand all the aspects. They couldn't understand why God was silent for 40 days. They didn't want to wait patiently on God. Folks, do we know the true God? You know, to know the true God, all we have to do is return to the source. When we return to the source, God shatters any falsehoods of himself that we might have. All it takes is for us to read Ezekiel 24, 16, just as an example. Folks, this, in my opinion, is one of the most difficult scriptures to read. Ezekiel was a prophet in the Old Testament, and he was prophesying about God's coming judgment. He was telling the Israelites that they had messed up. They, had, they were following false idols. And then in Ezekiel 24, 16, God comes to Ezekiel and says this, Son of man, with one blow, I will take away your dearest treasure. Yet you must not show any sorrow at her death. Do not weep. Let there be no tears. Verse 18, so I proclaimed this to the people the next morning, and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did everything I had been told to do. Folks, you read a scripture like that and you say, God, God, how could you? God, I thought you were a good God. All the good gifts come from the Father of lights. And here you're saying, you're going to take this thing away from him? Lord, is, is, this is not, surely this is not you. Surely this is not the God that we worship. Do we know God? Do we know this God? The God that is capable of something like that? And you say, why, Lord, why? Why, God, why? I mean, surely you must have a good reason. And God says to Ezekiel, this is a testimony for the people. Why? Well, we don't really get an answer. We don't really get an answer as to why God wants to do something like this. It's just like Job, we don't get an answer. You know, Job never got an answer. Maybe you guys know Job, the guy who went through all the troubles and his friends came and were just talking a lot of things in his ear. In the end, when God is finally speaking to Job, he doesn't say, Job, this had to happen because A, B, C, whatever the reasons. God never tells him that. Job never gets an answer as to why. But what Job does get, Job gets a better understanding of who God is. Job gets a better knowledge of God. And then he no longer needed to know why. Folks, I want you to hear this. If you truly know, if we truly know who God is, if we can grasp, or if we are running, if we're seeking to know who God is, then we don't need to know why some of the things happen that happen. Do we know the real who? Do we know the real God? Truth of the matter is, we probably have some idea. We probably have you know, some, some aggregation of, of the facts or sermons or Bible readings or whatever it is, and we can kind of piece together, this is sort of what God is in our minds. But like the Athenians, we have our own conceptions that we can grasp, we can hold on to. And the call for us this morning, folks, is to pursue a deeper knowledge of the true God. To seek to know Him. To know Him. Not just to have some conception, not just to have him just be some part of my life. You know, God is good and like God works. Sometimes you hear that, yeah, God works, you know, he, he, he works. God's not there to work, folks. He's not there just to, just to work for us or just to, just to improve our lives. God is there to be known. We have to know God. We have to seek to know him. And God will absolutely fault false, sorry, God will absolutely fight against the false ideas of himself. He loves to do this. I'll just bring one example. 
There's an interesting story in the Old Testament. Uh, before David and Saul, there was war between Israel and the Philistines. And the Philistines beat Israel. And the Philistines took the Ark of God. The Ark of God represented God, represented the presence of God in Israel. And the Philistines also had a lot of idols. And so they bring the Ark of God to their temple. They want to put the Ark of God, the God of Israel, in their temple. They just want to make him another one of their gods. And they put him in the temple of a god by the name of Dagon. And Dagon was considered the father of the gods. He's like the top god uh, in the Philistine pantheon of gods. Uh, and this is sort of to, to signify that, you know, the God of Israel is now going to be subservient to their, their super God. And it's, it's a fascinating story when you read this, when they put the Ark of the Covenant in that temple, and the next morning they get up, they come into the temple, and they see that Dagon, their God, was fallen on his face. What do you do when your idol is fallen over? Well, you pick him back up and you put him in his place, Right? And they do that. And then the next morning they come and Dagon is again laying on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. Except this time his head is broken off and his hands are broken off. And it's just such a clear example, such a clear message that God is sending even to the Philistines. That, there is, there, that God will fight against anything that exalts itself above him. And God will fight against the false notions, the, the misconceptions that we have about him. In Isaiah 42, God says, the I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to anyone. God will not be worshipped as any, anything other than himself. Paul says that we cast down every argument and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And God will cast down these misconceptions because if we have some false idea of who God is, then we, we're, we're worshiping some incorrect idea of what God is. And folks, again, my call this morning is for us to seek to know the true God. He, he is not, see, God is not something that, is, that we can package down and understand in, you know, five, the five steps to understand God. It's a lifelong process of knowing God, of seeking to know him. Because God is other than us. He's not like man. The Bible tells us he is not like man. He's not like us. And his ways are significantly higher than ours. And so this morning, I, I, I want to invite us to know the true God. God must be, as Jesus told the Samaritan woman, worshipped in spirit and in truth. If we were to worship God, it is to be in the true knowledge of God. And that's why Paul is perturbed. He's supposed to be on vacation. Paul's supposed to be on vacation. He's supposed to enjoy his time away from being persecuted. And, but he's perturbed. He can't. He can't stand by idly when people are worshiping an incorrect God, an untrue God. The God, the true God is unknown to them, and Paul cannot stand by idly. And in speaking to the Athenians, Paul, Paul gives us a few things, and I just want to highlight them here for us. A couple points so we can package this down a little bit, even though we're not supposed to package God, right? The first point that Paul is making to the Athenians is this. First thing he says, God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs something. In other words, God is beyond the mere comprehension and grasping of humans. He is, we cannot fully fit God into our brain. And folks, let me tell you, if God can fit into my, what is it, five, eight pound brain, he's not a God to be worshipped. That is not a God that we should try to seek to know. But we can make two inferences here. The first inference is this, that uh, our purpose in life then is to seek to know God, is to pursue a knowledge of God. See, God, knowing God is not just like a, okay, I, I spent my time and I know, now I know God. Paul says he pursues a knowledge of God. He says he forgets what's behind and he presses forward. In Philippians 3, he says, I count everything as loss, everything as loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In verse 10, he says, that I may know him. I have lost everything that I may know him. That is our life goal. That is the purpose. That is the point of a Christian life. It's to know God. We like to read Jesus' final prayer uh, 
in John 17, and we like to focus on the fact that Jesus is praying that God would make them united. But he starts off his prayer in the very beginning. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Well, hold on. I thought eternal life was joy and righteousness and peace and all these good things that we can enjoy. But Jesus says eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So the first inference we can draw from this is the purpose of our life is to know God. That is why we're here. The second inference we get here is that we can never exhaust the depth of the knowledge of God. We will never get to the bottom of who God is. And that is, again, what makes him worth worshiping. Romans eleven thirteen 13 tells us, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Isn't this amazing? No matter how much you've gotten to know God, there's always more of him to know. It's never boring. It's never, it's never stagnant. It's never like, well, this is another, just another day in paradise with God. No, there's always freshness. There's always something new to know about God. There's always newness. God says, I create all things new. And he does. And that is the amazing thing about, about pursuing God is that everything in life will disappoint, but a pursuit of God, a pursuit of God is an inexhaustible source of satisfaction. That is why we're here. We're here to pursue knowing God. The next thing that Paul tells them is that God has determined the times and the boundaries and the habitations of the people that he has created. And so we come to the second point, that God is sovereign. When we pursue a knowledge of God, when we pursue knowing God, we find that God is sovereign. God does what he wants. He acts according to his purpose. He moves the levers of, man, of mankind as he sees fit. You know, sometimes we read the Old Testament and we think, okay, this king came out against this king and the Babylonian king came out against this guy and then there was this other, there's this whole geopolitical mess. But then as you read the prophets, God says, I am the one who is sending so-and-so against this guy. And then God says, after he has served his purpose, I will send another one. And so who is it? Is it just the, the ambition of man that is driving history? No, we see that God is the one who ultimately has the pen of history in his hand. Because God is sovereign. God does as he pleases. God reserves the right to do as he pleases. And the fact that God is so gracious to us doesn't mean that he has no power in our life. Because God is so good, I mean, sometimes we forget that God is, is really, he's pursuing his own purposes. Yes, he does everything and he has a plan for us and it is good. But it is his plan for us. Not our own plan. Not what we think is good. But what God knows is good. What God knows is good. Sometimes we think that Sometimes we see what God knows as good to be not good for us. We think, Lord, but I think this is better. I think if we went this way, Lord, I have this vision and I have this, you know, I have this feeling that we got to go this way. And God says, no, I want to take you through here. It's his plan. He is working out his plan in our life. Perhaps there's another notion of God that we sometimes feel uncomfortable with. You know, that God is just, uh, you know, has to tell me what to do. Oh, come on, we're American. We don't like being told what to do. We want to be the captain of our souls. We want to be in charge of our own fate. It doesn't sit well with us that God does things despite our wishes, despite our choices, despite our actions. God does as he pleases. God is sovereign. God does according to his will. We read in Daniel 4.35. This is Nebuchadnezzar after God had removed him from being king and now has brought him back. And he says, for his kingdom, this is speaking about God, is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are of no account. But he does according to his will. Among the army of the heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can fend off his hand and, or say to him, what have you done? Folks, we can sometimes look at the sovereignty of God and think of it as a negative thing. Well, God is just, he's a tyrant. And, but that's, that's, not, that's not the attitude we ought to have towards the sovereignty of God. When we see God as sovereign, we should take comfort. 
And I think that when we don't want God to be sovereign, that is when we fall into things like fear, into things like uncertainty and doubt and anxiety, because we don't trust that God is going to have everything under control. We like to say that, oh, God is controlling the show, right? God is, he is, he's curating the show. But then we have this latent fear, like, oh, but oh, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, what if things are going to go wrong? What if the economy is going to go to, and it's, folks, if we believe that God is sovereign, if we have come to know that God is sovereign, then we have nothing to fear. If God is truly holding the universe in his hand, then what have we to fear? And this is a challenge for all of us this morning. Tomorrow, when you go and go home and you hear the bad news about how everything's just, <laughs> everything's terrible and there's the COVID and all that, the challenge for you is to instead look upon the sovereignty of God. Gaze upon how great and awesome and, and powerful and sovereign our God is and say, I'm going to trust this. I'm going to put my eggs in this basket. Amen. It's a great comfort in knowing that God is the one who directs our lives. When we, in our minds, start to strip God of his sovereign power, we become fearful of what man can do, of what nature can do, and even of what devil can do. The reason we don't fear the devil is not because we're so great and cool, but it's because we have a sovereign God. And the devil plays by God's rules. The devil cannot do more than God allows him to do. But if we accept that God is sovereign, we can rest in the knowledge that he is ultimately in control of our lives. Paul then says that in him, we live and move and have our existence. And the third point, and it's gonna be a brief one, is that God is our source. See, when we strive to know God, when we understand that knowing God is the purpose of our lives, and we find that he is sovereign, we find that he is in control, and in encountering his sovereignty, we find that he is our source. Everything comes from Him. You know, sometimes we, 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 we think that now because we're Christians, we have the power within us, right? We are sons and daughters of God. But Jesus said, I just want to remind you of the words of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the, the what? Branches. He says, you can do nothing apart from me. And again, that individualistic side of us wants to say, well, how come I don't have any of my own autonomy? when we know God, we find comfort in this because we don't have to rely on our own strengths. There's great comfort in knowing that God is your source because your strength will fail. If you try to do life on your own, you will certainly fall and fail because you don't have enough strength. We are limited as humans. And so if we want to rely on our own strengths, we will certainly fail. But when we rely on God as our source, we rely on the one who never fails. The Bible says those who, put their, those who put their hope in God, they will raise their wings. They'll rise up on wings like eagles. It's not, it's not if you, you know, take some energy shot or if you hear a motivational speech. No, it's if you rely on God, your source. God is our source. And folks, I'll just give you one more point and we'll be closing. Paul in, in verse 30 and 31, God, uh, Paul says in verse 30 and 31 that God is calling everyone to repent for he will judge the earth. And the four point, fourth point is simply this, that if we are pursuing to know God, if we're pursuing knowing God, if we're seeking to know him, and we find that he is sovereign, and we find that he is our source, we must submit to God. There is no other way. And folks, this final point, let me tell you, this is what makes the knowledge of God a knowledge of God and not a knowledge about God. Submitting to God Submitting to what you know about God is what makes your knowledge about God a knowledge of God. Maybe you've heard people say, you know, there's a head knowledge and there's a heart knowledge. And if you, if you just study and you got your theology and all that, you're gaining head knowledge of God. And people say, you got to apply it, right? You got to apply what you know. And this is how we know God. If we apply what we know about him, what does it mean to apply? Man, you hear this all the time. You just got to apply what you know. What does it mean to apply? It means you heard something from the pulpit or from the Bible, preferably what you read from the Bible directly, <laughs> and you listen to it. You obey it. 
In other words, you submit to it. Instead of saying, well, you know, I think the Bible has a pretty good idea here, but I'm just gonna, I have a different idea. I have something else I wanna try. To know God is to submit to him. John, 1 John 2, 3 says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Man, we like to put so many things there, right? If I speak in tongues, that means I know God. Or if I've read the Bible 10 times, or if I'm a pastor, or if I'm preaching, or if I've made it in ministry, or if people respect me, right, as pastor, or, or whatever it is. We put so many things in that place, but the Bible keeps it so simple. And this is why I think we constantly struggle with this. It's because we want to make things more complicated than the Bible has made them. It's simple. If, this is how we know that we know God, if we are submitting to His commands. If we live a life of submission to Him, if we say, Lord, if you say go, I will go. Lord, if you say stand here, I will stand here. Then we can say like Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Lord, I know you can, but even if you don't, I'm still, I'm still yours. I'm still submitting to you. I'm still listening to you, Lord. True knowledge of God. There can be no true knowledge of God without submitting to God. And folks, I just want to leave a quick footnote here before we wrap up about ministry and about serving. Serving and being in ministry does not guarantee us a knowledge of God. I know we think that that's sort of the next step in our, you know, when we get saved and we're starting to kind of learn about God and read Bible. And the next step is for us to start serving. And we feel like, okay, this is the pinnacle. We've reached it, right? But serving in ministry is not a knowledge of God. There's a time the Bible tells us about where people will come to Jesus and said, Lord, in your name, we perform many miracles. We prophesied. Man, prophecy is like, Paul says it's the best gift. We cast out demons. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. It's not, a, it's, it's, not a, it's not about what you do, it's about who you know. You know, it's like that saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It, it's the same in this case, folks. It's not about what you do, it's whether or not you know God. And ministry can certainly enhance our knowledge of God because we can have a direct, direct contact with, with what God does. But ministry is not a knowledge of God. Ministry is rather the proper outworking of a true knowledge of God. Folks, to know God is the highest purpose in life. And as we seek to know God, we find that He is sovereign. And in His sovereignty, we realize that He is our source. And when we come to a true knowledge of God, we must obey Him, we must submit to Him. That is what it, know, that is what it, that is what it means to know God. The hardest thing to do is to obey. It's easier to sit and listen, to try to memorize, but to obey, to put into practice, that's the most difficult thing. That is why there's a quote, there's a great quote by a great Christian. It says, to know God is at once the easiest thing and also the most difficult thing in the world. But this is our calling. This is what we're here for. This is why we do what we do. This is why we do church. It's because we want to know God. It's not because we want to impress people, but because we want to know God. We want to have a deep and true abiding knowledge of God. I want us to stand and I want to close with this verse 27 in that scripture that we read. It's a wonderful verse, one of my favorites out of, out of the whole Bible. And Paul says that God put them on the earth, that is us people, put them on the earth that they would seek God. If perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I love this verse because the Bible says that we, sometimes we feel like we're in the dark and we feel like we're just, oh, we're just pushing, Lord, we don't know. Are you here, God? Where, where are you taking us? And the Bible says that he is not far from each one of us. He is near. But the really wonderful thing about this verse is the phrase, each one of us. Sometimes we like to get lost in the sea of the church, you know, and God is with us, God is with us. But this verse particularly says that God is with you. Not you collectively, you personally. You personally, you individually, God is near you. He knows you. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows all of your deepest secrets. He knows your fears, knows your pains, 
knows your faults. He knows all of it. The Bible says that God is near to the brokenhearted. He's near. He knows you. And God wants us to know him. The Bible says, Paul says, that one day we will know him like he knows us. He knows us so intimately, so deeply. He understands everything that, that everyone else doesn't understand. He understands all of it. He sees the whole picture. But folks, my call again this morning for us is to not leave the true God as the unknown God. But may he be the known God in this church, in our lives. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful scripture, God, that lifts us up, Lord. This wonderful scripture, God, that encourages us, Lord. This wonderful, Father, word, God, Lord. This, this wonderful scripture, God, that reveals to us that our purpose in life is to know you, Lord. God, our prayer this morning, Lord, is that you would draw us into a deeper knowledge of you, God. A deeper, a more intimate, Father, Lord. A true knowledge of you, God. Lord, that the misconceptions, God, that we like to construct, Father. Lord, our own ideas of who you are, God. Lord, that you would come, Father, and you would, you would cast down the things that are incorrect, Lord. God, may we, Lord, Father, just in, in feeling for you, God, in stretching towards you, God, may we feel refreshed, God, and encouraged, Lord, that your spirit is with us, God, that you are near all of us, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you have loved us so. God, that you have redeemed us to be with you, Lord. And it's only through Jesus Christ, through the revealed word of God, that we are able to know you, Lord. And I pray, God, that as we go from this place, Father, that we would seek to submit to you, God, to submit to your, to your word, Lord God, and to live a life of obedience, Father. Because there is power in obedience, Lord. It is when we obey, God, when we submit, Father, when we humble and lower ourselves, God, that your power can shine through, Lord. And we can live a life of victory, a life of strength, God, as we submit to you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would make this scripture active in our lives. I pray this in your name. Everybody said,